All right, afternoon, everyone. So today we're going to talk about foundation reuse. Um, foundations have been reused forever. And uh, something we need to do a lot more of with the climate emergency and the drive to reuse many buildings. Not only does it require top-notch geotechnical skills, but also an innate understanding of logistics, constructability, risk management, and also insurance. Uh, today, uh, we've got Rachel Monteith, our head of UK Grand Engineering, Nigel Pickering, our technical director in Grand Engineering Group, and Chris O'Hara, associate director, are going to take you through the presentation. And then we'll open up for questions at the end. Over to you, Rachel. Thank you, Frank. Right. Let's see if we can move these slides on. Right, so what we've done is we've split the presentation into sort of three, under three headings. So we're starting with the sort of background, context, moving on to our Bureau Hapold expertise and uh, ending with some next steps because we believe that this is a process that we should all be going through now. So the key principles, what I'm aiming to do is just sort of set the context for foundation reuse here. Um, why do we have foundations? Uh, obviously the, the image on the left there is the bell tower at Pisa. And to my mind, this is one of the few successful geotechnical failures. Because the primary objective in providing foundations is to control settlement which we also refer to as a uh, as serviceability case. And the behavior of the foundations, the, the, the settlement response of the building is directly uh, related to the geology of the location of the, the structure, especially soils and water. So absolutely fundamental. And as Frank said, this is an idea that time has come, but it's actually always been um, the norm. Before the 20th century, reuse was what we did, what everybody did. In London, um, during the reign of Elizabeth I, it was mandated. New buildings had to be raised on old foundations. And churches, cathedrals, important buildings, anything before the 20th century tended to be raised on old foundations. So when St. Paul's burnt down, the new building was, the new, uh, the new magnificent new building was built on the original foundations. Not exactly square, but pretty much. More recently, we have been trying to push for reuse. There's good uh, guidance, there's good experience. But it hasn't been as successful as we would like it to be. And maybe now we're moving forward. So what do we mean by foundation reuse? Well, the common assumption is it's a superstructure replacement. Um, but actually, probably the more common reason for, for um, reusing foundations is actually be, where we're changing the loads, where we're adding a story, where we're altering the building in some way and increasing the superstructure loads amending them and it's not uncommon where um, the loads being increased where we'd have to augment or strengthen the foundations in order to to deal with that excess overload but it's all foundation reuse and to date the existing drivers have have been fairly straightforward. We have had archaeological constraints in uh, our major cities with um, uh, archaeologically important remains. The image shows um, the area in York where reusing foundations is, is um, mandated by the council wherever possible. Another key reuse is where the or, or driver has been where the superstructure is being 
reuse. And again, this is a, a really, really common reason for reusing foundations. Um, the image here is Lots Road. Again, in order to reuse that building, the foundations had to be reused. And we've also got client drivers um, where you have foundations, existing foundations, and the client is keen to incorporate them into new, uh, new development. Um, that's, been, that's been a successful reuse driver. Why Bira Happold? And honestly, it's part of the ethos of the company. It is the heart of the Bira Happold's approach. And we have a significant portfolio of reuse and refurb uh, right around the world, in fact. But those are some sample images uh, of projects and some, which, well, most of these we, we will be talking about. So we've had our existing reuse drivers. What's, what are the new ones? And front and center, the climate emergency. Professional bodies, governments, uh, agencies, local authorities, businesses are set out on the right hand side, some of which we do business with, people on the school will be doing business with, of signing up to um, climate commitments to reducing impact. Within Bureau Happold, um, amongst other companies, we are committed to pushing the um, nationally recognized targets further forward. Um, so aiming to, to hit targets by 2030 before 2050. Actually, that means we have to be hitting those targets now because the buildings we build today are going to be you know, built in 2030. So we are absolutely committed um, as it's set out in our, our global sustainability report. So how will foundation reuse help? Because foundations only, you know, you could argue, contribute 5% to the embodied carbon makeup in a, in a structure, in a building. But once you take into account the substructure, the uh, superstructure, you actually get close to 50% of the embodied carbon, which is kind of being led right through to the foundations. The other important consideration is whole life carbon. Most commercial buildings, indeed an awful lot of property, has a design or a commercial life of 25 to 30 years before it's refurbished. Um, the, this is actually quite important because actually that, that 25 to 30 years is longer than records are kept for construction records as built records. So it's a point you might want to come back to. But those foundations underneath the buildings will outlast the buildings by decades, centuries potentially. So there's a real opportunity here. Now, there's no question. Foundation reuse is viable. From a technical perspective, we have to confirm two aspects, really, the geotechnical principles and the material life of our existing foundation elements. And the principles that apply to both of these are broadly the same. We have to understand the current condition. We have to comply with relevant design codes. We have to satisfy approving authorities in both cases. Um, the validation is slightly different. Uh, we can test. Um, uh, if we have the opportunity to, but we have to determine the low capacity and the likely performance, however we choose to do that. And obviously when it comes to materials, we're looking at estimating the remaining service life and there are established techniques for doing that. So all technically viable. Hello. At the same time, there are perceived risks. Um, People will already have in mind insurance and warranties. We can address this um, in a pragmatic way. We can't solve the problem, but we can address the problem. 
there is perceived to be a risk when you're reusing foundations associated with the uh, 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 absence of certainty in cost and program. Again, we can we can address that. It's perfectly reasonable to observe that the foundations as installed are typically um, installed on grids that don't necessarily tie up with our, our new development. And there may be other issues. What we would like to do at this point is to run a quick poll. Hopefully it's going to be in a chat somewhere. And what we would like is for people on the call to hit or, or identify the most important uh, risk factor. And we'll come back to that, this later, um, if we may. I don't know if any people can see the poll. Yeah, the poll's launched. We've had about 50% of people have answered. <laughs> Fantastic. That's great. We'll get to about 75, 80 and see. Excellent. Well, we'll come back to this later. Right. And moving on very quickly. Um, so the important thing here is, you know, when to engage. We know that the technical risks can be managed and other risks can be managed. Um, it's when do you get started? Well, the best opportunity sits right at the front end with the brief, with the concept. At that point, we can make some really key decisions. Thereafter, we lose opportunity. We lose opportunity quite quickly as you go through the REBA stages. So engage, engage early. And it's a, what do we need? What information do we need to seriously consider foundation reuse? Ideally, we will have as built information. However, in practice, because people um, are only required to keep information for 12 years. And typically you're looking at a minimum of 20 years before you're considering this. We don't have as built information. However, we can look at actual performance. We can look at material properties. We can investigate and we can find out the information that's required to con seriously consider the vi viability of the reuse. And so lastly, why would we consider this? Well, obviously, uh, reduced embodied carbon, reduced build cost. Um, you're not putting in any of that foundation, or, uh, uh, the, the foundations that are already there. You may be augmenting, you may be making modifications to substrata, but you are reducing the cost. And obviously there's program efficiencies. You're not maybe bringing big piling rigs onto your site or what have you. And importantly, today we're meeting market demands. The market is, actually requiring us to seriously consider repurposing, reusing. And that's my little piece. And I am going to hand over to Nigel to talk through some case studies and we'll sort of share these between us. Thanks, Rachel. Um, hi all. Um, I'm Next slide. I'm just going to talk through a few case studies where, which will illustrate some of the principles that uh, Rachel's been talking about. Um, the first one is uh, a typical residential block, and it really epitomizes the, the reuse of foundations. Um, so it's an existing four-story residential block. Uh, the client recognized that there was an opportunity to add an additional floor on top, which um, to extend the roof and provide more space. Um, our role as Bureau Happold was in su supporting the uh, application to building control to demonstrate that this was a viable solution. Um, the design approach taken was to carry out a death study, review the ground investigation information, and to carry out a detailed load takedown of the actual loads coming down onto the foundations. And in fact, this was not a foundation failure issue. This was much more of a serviceability issue. So putting extra load onto the foundations was not going to um, cause failure of the foundations, but the, the, there was potential for additional settlement. Um, uh, obviously, there was a, an institute investigation to confirm the depth of the foundations, the diam uh, the the, the breadth of foundations and the depth uh, and all that was 
parcelled up into our assessment uh, of of the foundation reuse uh, to demonstrate that th this this could be achieved and and there was no detriment to the to the existing foundations. Um, the next slide. Next slide is Lots Road, which Rachel mentioned earlier on. This is, this is a power station built uh, around the turn of the last century. I went through sub subsequent modifications in the 1960s, um, and it, it was an obvious candidate for, for foundation reuse. It, it's a very complex array of foundations within the structure. Um, and our, our task was to try and identify which foundations could be re reused in terms of how they would fit in with the with the new proposed structure. Um, in order to do to demonstrate that with our structural colleagues, we um, we compiled a, a, a detailed model, which again looked at detailed load takedowns and looked at the response of the foundations. Um, the, the foundations were a mix of new piles installed in the 1960s and uh, mass mass gravity foundations installed at the original um, building of the of, of the power station and again this was a, a serviceability rather than a, a, an ultimate limit state i.e so we were looking at how how do the find how would the foundations perform under the new regime of loading rather than a, a foundation failure situation um, next one uh, University of Portsmouth, this is a site just on the north side of Portsmouth. Uh, originally the site was earmarked for a residential development. Uh, the piles had been installed in 2010-2011 um, and then the this, this scheme was abandoned because of the financial crisis. Um, the University of Portsmouth building is a new academic building with teaching and research facilities. So although it's, it's, it's a, a lower building than the original residential would have been. The, the actual layout is significantly different. And uh, as you can see from the image on the left, there's significant transfer structures. So there are high, high concentrations of loads, which won't necessarily match with where the existing piles are. But pile re reuse was an obvious, obvious way forward. And uh, we worked hard to, to develop a model that again demonstrated that we could reuse a substantial portion of the, the, the existing piles. Um, next slide. Um, so key points, uh, we, as you can see here, for this particular core uh, under one section of the building, we managed to use more than half of the existing piles. Um, it was not an easy task because the, the, the existing piles are obviously in place and don't necessarily match where the structural loads are coming down. But through the modeling um, that was undertaken, uh, we were able to demonstrate that uh, sub uh, supplementing with a number of new piles would make the this, this scheme worthwhile. Um, there was a number of discussions over warranties and insurances because it was a relatively new job. Um, and the, the, the possibility of a warranty being assigned was discussed. Um, in, in the end, it was uh, dealt with through insurances. Um, just as a, a note on verification and validation, we had reasonable as-built records and including some pile testing, but we knew the ground conditions were fairly complex, um, comprised in Brackelsham beds. Uh, so we, we wanted to do a regime of verification testing, including static load testing, uh, as well as um, structural integrity testing on, on, on the piles as part of that validation. And all that would be packaged up uh, to support reuse and to, su to support um, uh, convincing the insurances to take on the, 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 uh, the new construction. Uh, next slide. Um, Project Mint is a, a new cinema which was uh, built within the Millennium Dome, now known as the O2 Arena. Um, as part of the original development for the dome, a large number of piles were installed to give um, flexibility in locating the not only the location but the type of 
exhibits that were going to be put in the exhibition because at the time it was built, that was largely unknown. So there was the, we benefited from a, a large number of existing piles within the site that could be reused. There, there were particular constraints because part of the site is uh, underlain by the Blackpool Tunnel, which has an exclusion zone. So I think the key message out of this, we, we managed to use more than 50% of the piles were reused, but it, it was a balance between knowing where the existing piles were, where your structural loads were coming down and what substructure in terms of pile caps, transfer structures, uh, and trying to get that balance right between the desire of reusing as many piles as you can, but not compromising that through overcomplicated substructure, which would uh, cause uh, additional costs and program delays. Um, so as I say, in the, in the end, we managed to use over 700 piles, which was more than 50% of, of, uh, of, of the re piles were reused. Um, next slide. This, this just uh, shows a before, during, and uh, uh, during after event. Uh, so we've got uh, precast piles and driven cast in situ piles being installed. And just an illustration of the environmental considerations, which meant that you know driven driven piles was the obvious solution to, to minimize any spoil um, uh, because of the ex existing contamination on the site. Um, the Olympic Stadium transformation. Well, the Olympic Stadium was built for the 2012 Games. Following that, there was a, a, a scheme to extend the roof and extend the seating to uh, to, to prepare for um, Premiership football. Bureau Hapold had been in, right, involved in the original scheme, um, but the extension of the roof created significant additional loading, particularly from wind and light. Um, just the, the 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 way in which the roof cantilevers over, there were significant additional loads which uh, exceeded the original um, foundation capacity. So the solution we came up with was with to to supplement existing pile caps. Uh, an illustration on the right there um, with new piles, new mini piles because of access restrictions, and then tie the new piles to the to the existing piles. Um, next slide. Next slide. This slide just demonstrates or illustrates how that was done with the new new piles being broken down and then being keyed into the existing pile cap to support the uh, the V columns, which ultimately support the new roof. Um, and with that, I will hand over to Chris, who will take on some right. other case studies. Thanks, Nigel. Yeah, hi everybody. Um, the next case study we're going to talk through is the uh, the work we're doing at Manchester Airport. Um, we've been working at Manchester Airport as a practice for several years now. And this scheme, uh, the the case study that I'm going to talk through is the Terminal Two extension and refurbishment. Um, the existing terminal is the blue building on the uh, on the image on the right hand side, um, and it's disappeared. Sorry. <laughs> Um, and the, there's an extension, basically Ma Manchester Airport Group wanted to uh, double the capacity at Terminal 2. So the, uh, the intention is to refurbish the existing Terminal 2, which is the blue building, and an extension, which is the grey building, uh, which has just been completed and has opened a few months ago. So we're now focusing our attention on the, term the existing terminal building, uh, which is, remains live. Um, and structurally, we're going to be reconfiguring internally a number of elements, um, infilling floor voids, removing certain areas of floor, new columns, removing columns. So essentially, we're, in, uh, we're, we're increasing or changing the, the load path through the structure, which from a ground perspective gives us a little bit of concern about overstressing the remaining or existing foundations in the ground, which ultimately precipitates in, in settlements. Next slide, please. So we started by looking at what inf information we had already for the site. Um, we had some historic GI, some historic borehole information, and we were also fortunate enough to get the as-built drawings from when the existing terminal was built, which gave us some, some real uh, steer on 
what was in the ground, the geometry of the existing foundations, the type of foundations. Uh, so we reviewed all the information and decided that we needed to bolster uh, the information that we did have. Uh, and we devised some additional ground investigation, both exploratory holes, uh, vertical exploratory holes and some trial pits to expose and just validate the the existing geometry of the foundations to see if it tied in with the as-built drawings. All very straightforward apart from it's in a live airport terminal um, and ground floor level at Manchester Airport Terminal 2 is the baggage reclaim hall with a number of baggage carousels. Um, so quite a challenging ground investigation, a lot of it was airside so we had issues with permits. Um, but ultimately we got in, there was restricted headroom. Uh, one of the biggest constraints was time um, as people were leaving the terminal on the last flight that came in at about half one in the morning. We followed in behind them till about five o'clock, uh, at which point we had to be out. So a couple of shifts and we got the information that we needed, um, uh, validated the existing geometry and managed to take some, uh, some, some calls through the existing foundations all of the information was great and increased our confidence in both the ground model and the information that we'd been provided with. Next slide, please. So with that increased confidence in the information, we then went to do some computational assessment, looking at predicted settlements across the, the terminal building uh, with the new foundations and the new loads. <laughs> excuse me and the exercise which is just about coming to an end as we speak is that the the current situation is we envisage about 10 percent of the existing foundations will be overstressed uh, and again we're talking in uh, in serviceability limit state uh, and that the settlement uh, will be excessive to what we consider to, to be acceptable to the structure so Work in progress, we're currently working, or we'll be working through um, some enhancements, local enhancements to the existing foundations uh, and watch this space yet to be decided. Next slide, please. Uh, we're still in Manchester, but we're in the city centre at campus. Uh, a Brownfield Canal side redevelopment, um, lots of different facets to it, repurposing of, of warehouses, new build residential blocks, really challenging ground conditions. Um, there was a, an infilled canal basin under a large majority of the site. There were two tunnels which were problematic in identifying location wise. But what I want to talk about uh, on this scheme is the repurposing of the um, 1970s, uh, it's been called a brutalist concrete tower block, um, which is the image on the left. So when we arrived, the, that's what the site or the, the building looked like. Uh, the client wanted to repurpose that building uh, from a university building into a residential development. Um, we, they, they went away and did a commercial um, assessment and came back and concluded that if we could add three stories to the building, it would be commercially viable. So we worked, we went away with our structural colleagues uh, who did a lot of work looking at existing load takedowns for the building um were able to reassess the safety factors used because of the uh, the change in use from a, a, an educational facility to a residential uh we took off a lot of well the, the most well all of the concrete uh cladding came off which was very heavy which reduced the loads uh and other elements such as the thick floor screeds were removed as well to increase the floor to ceiling heights for the resi use so Overall, uh, our structural colleagues uh, with ourselves did um, quite a detailed assessment and concluded that uh, including the three-storey Metsec lightweight uh, steel frame uh, uh, for the three-storey addition, uh, compared to the existing load takedown on the old building, there was a net balance essentially and the foundations underneath were feeling uh, as happy as they were previously and there was uh, a negligible increase. Uh, we worked closely with building control to get the agreements uh, the, uh, the, that were needed um, and ultimately through the work that our structural colleagues and ourselves did, Bureau Happel were able to make the refurbishment and extension commercially viable to the client. Uh, great project to be involved in. I'll hand over to Rachel. Right, so this is uh, Battersea Power Station, very obviously a fabulous, iconic building, uh, but a long time derelict. 
um, it's a listed building, so the superstructure such as remained and it's quite a considerable amount of uh, structure was retained, um, but in a fra fragile state, in a very fragile state. So again, settlement is incredibly important. Um, and importantly, the new uh, use of the building is actually heavier than the uh, uh, original. Uh, there's a lot of fresh air in a, in a power station and the new use, my goodness, I mean, it's just packed full um, and fantastically, fantastically ex uh, um, carried out. So in order to reuse the structure, we really had to reuse the foundations. The foundations, um, the, the, the power station was actually built in two parts. The A station was commenced in 1929, the B station in 1939. The common elements are the wash tower bases. The wash towers are the big brick structures beneath the, um, beneath the chimneys. Um, but on the A station, there are a lot of driven piles with caps. And on the B station, there are very deep pads Neither elements, none of the elements from a foundation perspective is designed in the sense that we would design them today. But we were really fortunate to have the, um, uh, to have a lot of original drawings that showed design intent and indeed the, the loads that they intended for to be carried on these elements. Now for the uh, piles for the A station, we, were, we carried out explicit um, investigation to validate them. For the pads for the B station, there was more analytical work carried out and soil testing uh, to, to validate these. Um, this next slide um, is part of the story associated with this um, structure in orange, which is the, um, which is all to be retained. And there's a key principle here, do no harm. But the new structure is coming down right alongside it, incredibly tight tolerances. So it is, has to be, we have to carry this heavy structure down uh, and also we've compromised it you know cheerfully because you do by excavating a basement alongside of the foundation element now this is a this is a, a broad scale uh, investigation um, an analysis of what the impact of loading the ground through uh, the piles through unloading what the what impact it will have on that foundation um, it's a really good piece of engineering and there are many, many more analyses that go with this whole, um, these, these elements to demonstrate that we would do no harm, that there would be no movement and this structure would not, not be compromised. Um, when it comes to the, we're fortunate that we were able to specifically validate um, the piles. We could carry out load testing across the site. We could demonstrate, we could validate the lengths shown on the drawings through parallel focus parallel seismic investigation. We were actually able to test a number of piles to failure um, to determine the load capacity, and we're also in a position because bear in mind these piles are coming up to a hundred years old. They have long since gone through their design life um, to demonstrate that the, the material that the piles are made of, the, the material the pads are made of, um, is good for uh, future life. Um, that is, none of this is doing uh, Battersea Power Station, the work on Battersea Power Station justice, but it, it's a it, just whizzing through. We manage the residual risk through thorough investigation, through testing and validation, through um, geotechnical numerical analysis, basic soil mechanics evaluation, um, and of course instrumentation and monitoring. 
And through that, we were able to ensure that the structure was protected, that the planning authorities were satisfied, um, and the insurers were satisfied. And the finished, the, the finished work on the power station looks sensational. So, you know, hugely successful. No one will ever see the foundations again, but we know they're working. Um, right, that was a Wessel stop through, stop tour through a tiny proportion of our projects where foundations have been reused. Um, there are many more and there's much more information, but we don't really have the time. So I'm going to hand over to Chris to do, to, to, to whiz through a next steps piece. Chris. Great. Thanks, Rachel. So next steps. Um, the principles we've kind of touched on through all the case studies that we've just, just run through. Um, but what needs to happen is a fundamental shift in mindset across the industry, uh, primarily around two aspects, and those being engagement and risk. Next slide, please, Rachel. So the, the graphic here, um, when we're talking about reuse of foundations, we're essentially looking at carbon reduction potential of, of, of a substructure. Uh, the graphic here, um, kind of similar to the graphic that Rachel showed a little bit earlier, looking at REBA stages, but the, the key message here is engagement. If, um, if we were to build nothing or add nothing more to the substructure, um, then essentially we are dictating the superstructure by what's in the ground. And if that is the case, then we need, and we, we, by virtue of that, we would have 100% carbon reduction. However, we would need to be engage right at the planning stage it's a fundamental you know the the whole scheme revolves around the substructure and that decision has to be made early in, in, in any development if like uh, nigel's touch on at lots road and battersea uh, manchester airport if we if we are engaged at the very early design stages then we can undertake the work that the the, the, uh, the case studies have showcased and essentially we we maximize the use of the existing asset with a few uh, additions here and there. But we have to be engaged right at the outset to be able to bring that to the table. And likewise, through the design process, we have to build clever. We have to optimize the materials that we're using. Uh, and again, we need to be looking at low carbon material alternatives. So key, key messages, early engagement, not just from the ground engineering team, but uh, as a collective around the table, uh, as a design team. As Bureau Hapo Ground Engineering, early engagement, we can identify and quantify risks and inversely any opportunities that we've got and ultimately manage the risk to, to, um, to, to gain confidence, build confidence. Sorry, next slide. Thanks, Rachel. Uh, so the second aspect, risk. Uh, is foundation reuse risky? Well, Maddy, have we got the results of the poll that we had earlier, please? And see what people's perceptions may be. Okay, so it's a reasonable spread, but there's there's a an out and out winner, which is unsurprising, of insurances and warranties. So which completely agree. The risk profile, um, uh, you know, that's one of the key risks that needs to be addressed. When we look at the word or talk about the word risk, um, people often get scared. The, there is a people's perception of risk is very different. Some people are very risk averse. Fight or flight mode kicks in. Too risky. Don't want to know. Well, as ground engineers, um, there's inherent risk in the ground, uh, so we deal with risk every day. And risk isn't something to be to be shied away from. It's something to be understood and managed. Uh, and inversely, uh, and, and the biggest uh, concern or risk is the insurance people or the, the warranties, and ultimately they deal in risk. That is their job. They they look at risk, they assess risk, and then they manage risk. So good good parallel crossover between ground engineers and insurance people. Looking at risk, there's fr there's three main um, aspects that need to be dealt with. We have to assess the risk. We have to uh, sorry, we have to identify the risk. We have to assess the risk. Uh, and quantify it to understand the risk profile and then we try and manage the risk as we as much as possible um next slide please 
every every risk or every problem can be managed not not solved but it can be managed to a point of where risk can be then quantified to be either acceptable or not and there are tools that we use in foundation reuse uh, to help us manage the risks and they include things that we've discussed before about uh, existing uh, as-built data, load testing, quantification, ground conditions, and, and feeding into the constructability. Whatever solution we come up with, it has to be buildable um, uh, and it has to be cost effective. And ultimately, we have to manage the risk sufficiently to gain the insurances that the client needs. Next slide, please. So very quickly, and, and again, we've discussed this previously on, on the case studies, when we're looking at, at uh, identifying the risks, the, the, the key data sources that we would want to try and find, often we don't have this to, uh, to, to hand, but they would be as built information, calculations, foundation calculations that talk through uh, facts of safety that we use, geotechnical parameters, codes of practice, ground conditions, exploratory hole records, and installation records, power installation records, telling us the geometry of the foundations that have been put in the ground and load tests, giving us a one-to-one -one scale model on how the piles will behave under load. Next, uh, next one, please. And again, these are, uh, Rachel talked through on, on Battersea. We move from the, the uh, identification to assessing, where we, we if, if, if possible, uh, and if, if able, we can go to site and do some static load tests to understand how the, the piles will perform under load, test them to destruction. Um, obviously, sacrificial, we're not going to reuse it after we've done that. Um, uh, if we haven't got that information available or the desk information is, is, is lacking, we can go and do further investigations, parallel seismics to try and understand uh, the pile diameters and lengths in the ground. And again, just going to site, exposing what we can see and getting materials uh, for design life for, of concrete, et cetera. Next slide, please. So once we've, once we've looked at the technical aspects, um, and come to a conclusion of, of how and if the, the foundations can be reused, we still have other answers, uh, other questions to answer. And that is, is, is reuse the right answer? And that's not directly uh, a function of technicality. Reuse, and rightly so, is becoming more and more desirable, but does reuse offer advantages over new foundations? Um, and it's been touched on before. There's, there's other things other than technical aspects that need to, need to align as well. Cost needs to be considered uh, and cost certainty. How can we get cost certainty from something with significant amount of unknowns? Program certainty and program is king, as we all know. Uh, again, what kind of program certainty can we get uh, from the information that we have? And sustainability wise, just because something would work, we don't need to shoehorn that in as a, as a foundation reuse. If we're pushing the problem further up the building, further up the structure with numerous transfer structures or other structural gymnastics that are needed, you know, it's an holistic approach. And when I say we, I'm talking the royal we. We as a design team, as a client team, everybody has to be aligned and understand and accept that there is a risk profile with, with reusing foundations, both technically and commercially. Next one, please. So there's, there's some great guidance out there, like Rachel's already mentioned, uh, the reuse of foundations handbook, uh, the Syria guidance, great roadmaps in there on how we work through this process uh, of if, if we can and uh, if we can reuse foundations and, and what the risks are. But ultimately, is, is reuse acceptable to all parties? And that includes uh, the buy-in of regulatory bodies. So we have to demonstrate technically that uh, foundations are um, uh, or the risk has been managed sufficiently to give confidence to the relevant bodies building control we need to have them on board they need to they need to approve the work that we're doing likewise funding and, and the client body they need to understand the risk profile so that they can then take that to the insurance people and the insurance people are, are happy to put the insurances in place to cover the residual risks so it's a collective effort that have to sign up to the risk profile next slide please so again so the, the main inhibitor for foundation reuse is uncertainty and uncertainty is risk if we can manage risk we manage uncertainty we increase confidence and ultimately as engineers that's that's what we need to be doing as a first part of this jigsaw puzzle once we once we gain the confidence we can come up with some great engineering some bespoke design 
Um, and, and, and as we've touched on before, the suitability of, of reuse is often performance based. It's not an ultimate limit state problem. The foundations aren't going to fail. The building's not going to fall over. It's how it performs. And that ultimately comes down to settlement. And we must remember that we're, we're not using like for like. The foundations that we're repurposing have been designed for a different reason. So if we increase the loads on them, we have to be confident with all the, the technical work and the assessments that we've done that the settlement is acceptable for the reason for the purpose that we need it to to perform under in the in the new case so again reinforcing that the the, the buy-in from the wider team is essential next slide please so just a quick a quick recap of the the decision making model as bureau happold we can help the clients and support the client and as a, as a wider design team that's what we need to be doing um, we need to provide the confidence technically by all the desk-based information and calculations, gaining confidence from testing and verification, understanding the risk profile, assessing the risks, helping manage the risks as much as possible, uh, feeding into constructability with contractors, the wider design team, ensuring that cost and program risks are managed, and ultimately what the environmental impact is on what we're proposing. And we, as, as an entity, can then support the client going to the insurers and then the insurers can see that we've understood and, uh, and identified the risks. We've managed, uh, we, we've assessed and quantified the risks. We've managed as much as possible and we've given the insurers the, as much confidence as we can for them to then put the relevant insurances in place. And this is all very much looking retrospectively at buildings that we're looking to repurpose now. Next slide, please, Rachel. We also need to look forward uh, for buildings that we're actually building, new buildings that we're building now. Uh, and the key to maximizing the reuse, is, as Rachel's touched on, in the future is, is collection of data. Key. All the, the, the string of, of all the slides that we've talked about is data. If we can keep, and if we have data, we can manage risk. It gives us confidence. So from now on, moving forward, there are, there are things in place on, on schemes now where we have to collect the data. The biggest risk moving forward is the safe pre uh, preservation. Uh, I know that at home in my desk in my office, I have a drawer full of floppy disks and CD-ROMs. Loads of information, really great information I can't access. The information is out there and we need to ensure that the, the preservation of it is, is, is in the right format for use in 30, 40, 50 years time. Thank you. I think that's the last slide, Rachel. Well, wonderful. Thank you very much, Rachel, Nigel, Chris, for this uh, um, really uh, enlightening uh, presentation. I uh, I really enjoyed that. Actually, it was very good and very um, thorough. Now, I um, some people have uh, posted a few questions, um, and I think quite a few of them have already been answered. Um, but just to pick maybe on a few tricky ones. Um, I'll, uh, one of the questions was, was where, do the, where does the commercial responsibility of the Reuse Foundation sit? Who would like to take that? I think, well, I think you're very well placed to answer that, Frank. But, All right, thank uh, you, Rachel. I'll, I'll, well. I'll, 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 I'll try and answer that then, if I may. Um, I think what uh, we've demonstrated today is that foundation reuse is possible. We can manage the risk, understand the risk, and to try and put it, maybe in my own words, and as simply as I can, we as structural and geotechnical engineers uh, will satisfy ourselves that based on a set of assumptions, say if you were to reuse piles, so based on the assumed pile diameter and pile length, which we will verify and material test and et cetera, et cetera, as Rachel said, based on all these assumptions, which are as best as we can verify, we will be happy and we are happy in recommending the reuse of his foundation and we'll say, yep, they will perform and we'll be able to take this additional load. However, there is a slight risk remaining, which is that 
we cannot test every square inch of concrete and test and measure the length of every part of the project. And we cannot account for, I don't know, a massive cavern somewhere on the site that no one has seen, you know, something like this. So there is always a residual risk and that's where the insurance come in. And that risk cannot sit with Burra Hapold. We're not able to, to insure that because that's completely beyond our control. In fact, it's beyond anyone's control. And so that risk must, however small, and that's our job is to try and minimize, minimize that as much as we can, um, that risk must remain client side and be taken on by the insurers. Rachel went through Battersea where um, we reused hundreds of uh, existing pies, overstressed many uh, uh, pad footings beyond what they were originally tested and, and uh, loaded at. And we managed to justify that and, and satisfy ourselves that it will be okay. And also more importantly, managed to satisfy the insurers of our clients that this would be absolutely fine. Um, so I don't know if you want to add anything, uh, but. I think, I think the important thing is that we, uh, what we really can, what is really, really important and it's point Chris made, um, and I think has actually, I hope has come through a number of these presentations. Grand Engineering Geotechnics um, focuses on managing risk every day. That is what we do. We don't have good data. We don't have perfect data for the soils. We have reasonable data. And always what we're doing is we are managing, managing risk. Um, so the word doesn't scare us. The word is merely a description of a concept that we need to address. So we will keep addressing it. And in doing this, we're providing good technical validation for success, um, for confidence to move forward. Thank you. I mean, one thing as well, there's a series of other questions which have been partly answered, like uh, um, uh, how do you, um, hang on, let me, um, uh, ah, I've lost it now, apologies. Um, what is the general process of uh, proving the stability of existing building pipes? I mean, we went through that at length, I think, so I'm not sure, I don't think we need to answer that. I mean, for me, one topic which hasn't really, or a question which hasn't been asked, and if I had asked the question, I would have asked this one as well as insurance is, one of the key things, and we've touched on that, is how do you implement the uh, reuse or strengthening or addition to existing foundation, which is quite often what will, as well as insurances and risks, um, determine the viability of a scheme or not. And again, we are very adept and we've got a huge amount of experience in ensuring that the solutions that are put forward are actually implementable and buildable. Battersea yeah. is a good example, Lots Road, Rachel. Yeah, I'm, I was just going to, uh, one thing about the, the slide showing the um, existing structural uh, existing structure at Battersea and how the piles came down alongside of it and how the loads transferred around it. One thing that's really, really important is you cannot not have that foundation, that existing foundation being affected. It's ensuring that in what, you, what we do, we are not doing any harm. Um, and it's a complete piece. There is an awful lot of work behind that. The, the image uh, that was shown is actually quite a simplistic one in reality. Um, there was much, much more behind it to justify it. And that followed through through instrumentation and monitoring. And I think for the future, instrumentation and monitoring is also going to be a real, we're going to provide real opportunities in this space. Now, I was trying to see if there were any uh additional questions in the chat, but I couldn't see any. Madeline, have, uh, Ali, have I missed any? Yeah, you've covered all of them. Okay. So um, Frank, just, just to jump in as well, I think yes. a, a point that's, that's worth reiterating is um, it, it's not just about risk, it's about engagement. And, and the earlier that, that, that 
the entire team engage. You know, it, there's, a, there's a part of the Syria document uh, that maps out that all the project team need to agree, uh, or, you know, not all parties involved need to agree and accept that there's risk associated with the reuse of, the reuse of foundations. You know, it doesn't sit with one entity. And the earlier that dialogue starts and the, the open and, and honest conversations that go on is the only way forward. You know, we can, we can manage the risk profile as much as possible. And if we get to the point where we've managed it as much as we can and the risks are still not acceptable to the client, then fair enough. You know, but there are, there are a number of parties that have to be in agreement as early as possible to, to go down this avenue, you know, and at any point stop. So it's worth just reiterating that, I think. That's a good point. All right. Um, well, thank you very, very much, uh, Rachel, Nigel, and Chris, um, for this masterclass. I've thoroughly enjoyed it. I mean, I suppose I'm a bit biased and partial, but still, um, I thought it was really good. So um, I um, would invite everyone in joining me in, uh, you know, thanking you and congratulating you. So thank you very much. Well, thank you for the opportunity. And um, obviously, we're very happy to follow up. We're delighted to, to, to you know, take any opportunity to carry on doing exactly what we are doing. And in, uh, because it's, it's, it's really what we need to be doing um, today. Thank you. And thank you to all the listeners who made the time to uh, um, listen to what we had to say. Thank you very much for your time. Bye-bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye. -bye. Thanks. Bye. Bye.